as hip hop started evolving, they made a movie called Crush Groove. And they show how I discovered it and brought it indoors. I played myself and everything. My key was seeing something before it happened. The first people I brought in was Rapper's Delight, Sugar Hill Gang. Uh, Run DMC did his first show there. Fat Joe, he blew himself up. He got his own record deal. Biggie's did his first show in the Bronx. Did Biggie? It. Biggie Smalls. Holy sh All right, it's Monday at 11 o'clock. You know what that means. The Chaz Palmetary Show. You know me, I have the most uh, uh, interesting guests on my show. I don't, I don't believe in just one way of just hiring, uh, you know, having guests on my show that are just the same thing. I like everybody. Now, here's a guy. You remember we had Fat Joe on a while ago, and this guy goes back a long way with Fat Joe. In fact, he was Fat Joe's first manager. He started Fat Joe, Grandmaster Flash, Sweet G. I'm telling you, he's from the Bronx. He's a legend. Started so many things, hip-hop, uh, freestyle, uh, disco. My man, Sally Abatello. Sal. Hey, hey. What's up, Chaz? How about you, Sal? Long Sal, time. so we go back a long time. I know you, yeah. but I just, you know, I love hip-hop so much. I love rap. And I'm from the Bronx. And be honest, everything started in the Bronx. Oh, God. Rap started there. Hip-hop started there. Uh, break dancing started yep. there. So tell like tell the audience, in 19, what was it, 1970 what? 76. 76. Who did you give your first start to? Well, 76 is when the club opened. Right. It started as like an R&B club, right? My dad opened it up. My mother came up with the name. We were watching John Travolta on TV. Right. And we're trying to get a name for the club. And uh, we had a few clubs in the Bronx already on 167th Street. We had Salt and Pepper. Salt and Pepper. We had Sugar and Spice on Burnside. So now we're going to open up this disco. And my mom comes up with the name. Why don't you name it Disco Fever? I said, Disco. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Good hook, you know, fever catching. Disco it. fever, yeah. Yeah, so we wind up doing, naming it the fever. So it started off as a disco first. Had Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Right. Had the Tramps. Had the Joneses. Music, push, push in the bush. So we're doing all that entertainment. And one night, this kid, Sweet G, he's DJing at four in the morning, you know, in the Bronx. We were staying open till eight in right. the morning. You know, everybody stood late. Nobody cared. Police just kept driving by. Right. So he gets up there and he starts doing these nursery rhymes back and forth with the crowd. Like, throw your hands in the air, wave them like, and I'm watching the crowd because I had just gotten off of work at the Golden Hour in the Bronx. Right. I was a bartender where you played in the right, band, yeah. Razz and Chaz. Right, that's right. So I would go there for a drink after, like four or five in the morning, and they would let him get up and DJ. And I'm watching him interact with the crowd, and the entire crowd is doing everything he's saying, like the Pied Piper, like Moses. And I'm like, what the hell is this thing that they're all becoming one person in the club? So I thought marketing-wise, it was a great opportunity to get strangers and people, doctors, lawyers, pimps, hookers, all together as one thing, all saying the same thing and having a great time. So it was a good way of people meeting each other wow. instead of just going up to a stranger. And I said, where could I find this music? And he says, oh, we got to go in the street. And I said, where? He goes, we got to go into the South Bronx and find. I said, who could we find? He goes, ah, I love Bug Starsky, Grandmaster Flash. I went, Grandmaster Flash, I want to go meet him. So he takes me to the park and I see Flash. He's in the park. And now it was a teenage thing. Drinking, drinking age back then was 18, which means everybody's sneaking in at 15 and 16 into the bars, right? right? Nobody's being monitored back then in high school. There was no cell phones. They didn't give so a shit. So if you were right. out all night, you got home and you got your right, ass right. kicked when right. you got home. Right. So I see a couple of hundred kids and he's got them all doing the same thing. And he's mixing on, on the two turntables, they're mixing the records back and forth. But it wasn't his music. It was like Jimmy Castor. It was other people's music that right. he was using for people to rap and talk over. Right. I said, this is gonna be the new shit. This is gonna blow up young, urban, black teenagers. You know, it's, no. it's, the music is gonna take its own. No, no so excuse me, most yeah. of your clubs, were they mostly black or black and white? Well, we started out with the Italian crowd, you know, on the Golden Hour. Right, yeah. And, and I had the Playhouse, right. which was the first disco in the Bronx right. on Tremont and Webster, right. which became Murray Richmond's offices. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right. We were from hell to heaven. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> so um, 
Then they started, yeah, they were all black. Uh, salt and pepper was on 167. Right. Uh, sugar. And then we had a skating ring on Tremont. I mean, on Mount Enon, 172nd and Jerome. Right. And that was cool. We had a, a disco downstairs in the basement where you had to get into a potato sack <clears> and go down a sliding pond. And you, you're up in this after hour place underground of the skating ring. So when the parents came in, they could go downstairs, have a drink, and they had cameras where they could watch their kids skating upstairs. So they would come in and they would bring their kids and they would still party. So yeah, mostly they were all black. All black. Yeah. Now when... So so you saw this thing, you saw some potential in this. So who were some of the groups that you started back then? So when I brought it indoors, it started to take off because now it was a venue where people that of interest with magazines or or uh, TV shows, they want everybody wanted to know what's this new thing in the street happening. So now there's a place that they could come see it, that somebody who owns it could take care of them if they bring in a TV crew like uh, from England or right. you know, started going all around the world. So the first people I brought in was Rapper's Delight, Sugar Hill Gang. Sugar Hill Gang. Did the bang, bang, boogies, they up jump the boogies. I mean, was the that rhythm. the first rap hit? That was the big first rap hit, 1979. Wow. It went on wax, Sugar Hill Records, uh, Sylvia Robinson, God rest her soul. She had that record, Pillow Talk. Yes. Remember? That was her. And she started this label, Sugar Hill Records, and uh, Sugar Hill Gang was the first one on it. The record blew up. I called up Carlos De Jesus, who was a jock on KTU. I said, you got to come hear this record. You got to put it on the radio. And he's like, ah, they're never going to put this rap music on the radio. Because a lot of people back then, the older black generation, they hated it. They thought it was fake. They're using other people's music. They're spitting into the microphone. They're not singing. They're talking. And they're like, what is this shit? You know? Oh, really? Oh, they were totally against it. They, they right. told my father, don't let your son take over this club. So anyway, I bring Grandmaster Flash in on a Tuesday night. The first night, it's a dollar to get in, a dollar a drink, 700 people show up. We have like four people working. It was crazy. Gangs, Black Spades, uh, uh, Zulu, uh, all, all the different gangs in the Bronx started coming you know, together. Right. And got all, it was high, this is the high school ghetto crowd. You know, gangsters right. in the street, and I'm because that was their music, and, right? Yeah, that was their shit, and I'm a white dude running this club. But I grew up in the South Bronx with my yeah. dad. He yeah. was on the Hump Forty Nine Third Avenue. My mom's from Washington <clears throat> Avenue, so that was no big thing to me. It was especially right. us. You know, we loved urban music. Absolutely, we all we always yeah. did. Yeah. So uh, Flash takes off Tuesday night, becomes successful, and then all of a sudden Wednesday, I said, "Let me go get another rapper, DJ Hollywood." Sweet G, Junebug, Eddie Chiba, Reggie Wells. These are all legendary black DJs. And I wound up going from one night to seven nights a week. I took the disco off of the Fever name and I called it the Fever. And, and then history was it. So you actually just, disco was gone and you just well, had disco Fever. Disco was dying, yeah. Yeah, disco was dying at yeah. the time. Wow. I, I mean, Fat Joe. I mean, you saw yeah. Fat Joe, right? You well, in, in that club, uh, that Fever on 167, uh, Run DMC did his first show there. So, Run DMC. So that was huge. So I have a flyer that we just found. <laughs> That's amazing. On the flyer, it says, performing this week, Run DMC, and next week, New Edition. That's, I, that was their first show, too, in, in the Bronx, New Edition. Bobby Brown and all those guys. Yeah, yeah. It's on the same flyer. So that was, uh, that was pretty legendary. I just got on and... Uh, at the USB Arena right. with New Edition, we got inducted into the Hip Hop Hall of Fame uh, Museum. Uh, so uh, Joe, now Joe, I see him in the, I meet him in the street, gangster. I mean, real gangster with right. a crew. But I don't know, he just took to me. He took to me. We became good friends, yeah. and he said, "Sal, I'm going to be the biggest rapper in the world." I said, "Okay, Joe, sure, all right, good." Right, right, Way right. to go, Joe. Yeah. But he believed it. He was one of the best marketers. He had posters on the highways, on buildings. How the hell did he get up there? Right. You're driving on the Deegan or the Cross Bronx, and right across, you see every poster, Fat Joe. He blew himself up. He got his own record deal. We became great friends. He was my promoter. And uh, he brought in some big wigs. He brought in Biggie's, did his first show in the Bronx. Did Biggie? Biggie Smalls. Holy shit, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, KRS-One. Yeah. Uh, huge and we discovered Wu Tang Clan, Method Man, and all those guys. Right. Actually, I just was with uh, Red Man Tuesday night. Wow. Uh, we, we had a picture at Red Alert's 40th anniversary party. So I grew up all those kids, uh, and they all became like 
really famous. Everybody's pretty famous right now. I mean, you were there at the birth of this yeah. stuff. Yeah, they call me. I get I get some good props being one of the pioneers bringing it, and I guess being white and Italian, they love that. They love that gangster shit. Oh, they love, love Italians. It. They love our our mannerisms, the way we dress. If you look, that's exactly oh how they dress. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, I mean, they want to they want to dress like us. We want to dance like, like them. them. You know, you know? I got my Timberlands, and, yeah. and, and they got their suit. You know, Bronx Tale, my movie's been on at least thirty five rap videos. Yeah. Oh, easy. Easy, easy. Thirty five. They love it. They love Bronx. They Tale. love it. They refer to it all the time. You know, when I had Fat Joe on, he, he talked to me about. You and he said, "Oh yeah, Sally was there, the very beginning, man." He, and he and it's just amazing how I, even back then I remember Sally. You were embraced by uh, the, the black community. I we just went to Red Alert's uh, 40th anniversary the other night. Right. The love I got, my son was with me. I must have hugged and got kissed by about 150 black people that truly love me because they feel that I gave them that opportunity. Not just the rappers. The producers, the writers, the bartenders, the waitresses, you're giving people an opportunity. At one point in 1983, I had like about 190 people working for me, and I would only hire people from the neighborhood that didn't have a trade, you know, because back then, you know, the Bronx was a war zone. War zone. Unemployment was like 30%. Nobody had jobs. Especially in the South Bronx. South Bronx. Oh. Right? Either you sold drugs or you were a stick up kid. That was it. That's that was it, the only huh? way you could make money. That's it. Wow. I, I, I heard a story. Somebody told me this once. And I, seriously, I got to ask you if it's true. Because the clubs you started, well, you know, it's very, you know, a lot of gangs to play. They were tough. They yeah. were tough. Is it true, Sal? Now, don't bullshit me. Did you have a thing where people had to check their guns? Well, <laughs> that, that's a great story that Fat Joe brings up all the time because that's how we know it's true. So anyway, what was going on with, in, in the 70s and 80s, there was such crime going on in the street. There was poverty. There was nothing. Everybody had a gun. Everybody. So now here's this situation where they're trying to get the gun in. I was the first one to put a metal detector in the club. So, you know, people are going, what the hell is this? It's beeping. Right. Frisking. I'm frisking people. So now all the guys that are gangsters... They didn't want to come out of their car, go into the fever, come out unarmed. You know, they could get stuck up or shot there. So they kept trying to sneak it in, and I didn't want somebody to get killed. So uh, I came up with an idea to check everybody's guns. So what I did was a code check, you get it, and I took the bullets out, gave them their bullets, and I would write their name on, yo, Bam Bam, uh, nine millimeter, all right, okay. <laughs> uh, Zulu, all right, uh, right, a 38 special. And we would give them the ticket, the code ticket, and at the end of the night, they got it back. So it eliminated me, it solved my problem of guns sneaking into the place. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, crazy. I mean, I... I heard that story and I said, no, that can't be. Well, it's it worked. It saved a lot of lives. It worked. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, they trusted that, me with their guns. You know, they I, I was so trusted back then. I was like their white guy. Yo, don't mess with Sal. I never got stuck up. I nothing. Ten years, seven nights a week, three thousand nights of hip hop. Never had a problem. You never had a problem. I, one problem at the end with one guy was just trying to shake us down for money and uh, you know, that situation yeah, escalated yeah. into whatever it was and then yeah. it ended. Wow. It's a great story, Sal. Thanks. But you and you still have fever. Yes. The, the club. Did you still have the club now? Not the club. No, no. I have a club in the Bronx called Evo Lounge, which is right near Parkchester. So I, I I'm a Bronx boy. I'm never gonna leave. I have to have something to go back to. Right. That I could go have a, a drink with somebody or a meeting or something. So, so uh no, but you do these events. Fe yes. called Fever. The, uh, freestyle fever. Freestyle. Now, what is the difference between freestyle and rap music? Okay. So the fever went from 76 to 86. Right. As hip-hop started evolving, they made a movie called Crush Groove. And they show how I discovered it and brought it indoors. I played myself and everything. But hip-hop started changing from party music to gangster music. Now you had the West Coast coming out. You had Ice-T, Ice Cube, Snoop. You know, it, it, Run DMC came out with It's Like That, The Way It Is, Sucker MC. So it started getting a little hard. So the original guys, like Curtis Blow and Sugar Hill Gang, they all started falling off because it was party music. Now it started getting into music where they were talking about what was going on in their lives. Like the gangster street. music. Gangster. Like the message. By, I mean, uh, do you think that... that uh, what was the name of the group? N.W. Uh, N.W.A. 
NWA, you think they started that? Uh, well, they were on the West Coast. Coast. Well, well uh, over here, we had Public Enemy on Def Jam. Russell Simmons had, they were, they were gangsters. They were gangsters, yeah. yeah. Because I remember when uh, NWA, they did a song called Fuck the Police. Yeah. And that was the first time anybody ever said yeah. that. And I think they, I think they got arrested for playing that song. Well, in, 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 they were, they were doing a concert, and the story is that if they put, did the song on the concert, they were going to get arrested. So they told them they weren't going to do it, but they knew they were going to do it the whole time. And the place went crazy, and that kind of set them off. You know, it, it took them to another level. And then on the East Coast, uh, Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel, put out the record, The Message. It's like a jungle sometime. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. And he talks about the trials and tribulations of what a black urban kid goes through in, in, in America. And they started saying it on records, and then it started getting noticed more. It had resistance in the middle, in the beginning, but, you know, it turned into they we all became billionaires, marketing geniuses. They sell liquor, they sell clothing. Yeah. And, they, and they're smart kids. They, they're, I love them. Uh, I get a lot of love and props from, from all of them. And the more it grows, is the more it just gives me the uh, opportunity to say, yo, I was one of the pioneers. You're who one of the pioneers of all that. Now, did you know Eminem at all? Did you ever get I, That's I never met him. <laughs> I just met Snoop Dogg for the first time at Yankee Stadium. He's my favorite. He gave up smoking. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. Not yeah. cigarettes. <laughs> but he gave up yeah. smoking weed. I couldn't believe it. Good for it. him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah, I think it comes to a point in your life where you got to make a decision oh. as you get older. You get smarter. Well, he says, well, my health and it stinks yeah. everywhere. yeah. And did you know that was fake? That well, was a big advertisement. What do you mean? For a he, smokeless grill. He didn't give it up? Nope. That was all hype for a smokeless grill. <laughs> Are you shitting me? That was a marketing ploy. <laughs> I love him. That's why I love him. He's the best. <laughs> Are you shitting me? I thought it was real too. Holy shit. I saw shit. a video. He's laying in bed <laughs> going, oh, I got to give it up, fam. <laughs> I'm out of here. You ain't going to see me for a few months. My man. But I don't know Martha, Martha Stewart he was with. But I don't understand something. Why did he have to give it up for an advertisement for a smokeless grill? He didn't give it up. He said he quit smoke. And people took that as he quit smoking. <laughs> oh, my God. He's the best. He's the best. <clears throat> give the guy fucking credit, man. Yeah. So <laughs> I met him. Uh, it was very exciting at Yankee Stadium when they had the... Uh, that big 50th anniversary. Yeah, club. yeah, yeah. And he uh, hugged me, whispered in my ear, he goes, damn, man, I wish I could have played your club. So I got my picture with him. I was happy. I oh, was good to great. go. Now, do you think, uh, Sal, that rap music, it was gangster. Now, where is it going now? Is it still gangster? Right it's now, it's like R&B-ish. You know, what's happened is that nothing took its place. That really cool 90s, early 2000s, you know, R&B, hip hop, and it's just, they're bigger than ever now. There's nothing new coming out for our generation because there's so many people that are in the 40s and 50s and 60 year olds, you know? Right. And, and like Busta Rhymes, all these guys, they're making more money than they ever made. They're packing arenas. Three, uh, 50,000, 60,000 people. Rhyme, Busta? Busta Rhymes. 50,000 people? Yep. They, LL Cool J's got a tour going on, selling out stadiums, baseball stadiums. Amazing. And uh, and again, and real, getting back to your question about the freestyle, in 86, they came and made a movie called Crush Groove, and they uh, showcased how hip-hop got discovered at the Fever and in the Bronx. Curtis Blow was in it, Run DMC, Russell Simmons, Full Force, yeah. Sheila E., New Edition. And then the Fever got closed up the night the movie came out for no cabaret license. After 10 years, they shut me down because the movie brought so much attention to the neighborhood, they wound up shutting me down on the technicality. And what do I see? I'm in the park going, what am I going to do now? And I see this Puerto Rican kid DJ in Little Louis Vega. And I see these Puerto Rican kids break dancing. And I'm sitting there and I said, oh, shit. Latin hip hop. I, I said, Dad, I got the next move. Latin hip hop, second generation Puerto Ricans doing, doing, they're singing though. They're not rapping, they're singing. They're from the salsa crowd. So I made the first record in 1984 again. Luckily, me, 10 blocks away from the fever, I make this record called Please Don't Go by a singer named Naomi. She's from the Bronx. The producer's from the Bronx. The Puerto it, Rican. She's Cuban and the producer's Cuban. Puerto Rican. The DJ's Puerto Rican, Little Louis Vega. And we put out the record and it blows up. Blows up. And it starts a whole scene 
with Lisa Lisa. So I said, I got to open up a club now to cater to this generation. There wasn't, the record wasn't out yet on the radio. So we opened up a club called The Devil's Nest on Dream Mountain Webster, catering to second generation Latinos, and the club blew up. And that's where everybody got discovered there. Got discovered there? Yeah. Cover Girls. You ever hear the Cover Girls? I heard that name. Yeah, that was my group. We had about 12 Billboard Hot 100 hits. And uh, uh, who got Information Society, TKA, La right. India. All these people got discovered at the devil's nest. So lightning strikes again 10 blocks from the fever. I was blessed. But it seems like, you know, you're blessed, Sal, but you're, you're, always, you're a very intuitive guy. You're always looking for the next thing. And when you see it, you know right away. My, my key was seeing something before it happened. Before it happened, and, right. That's, that's... You know, and I wouldn't sell myself out. I mean, I probably could have been the president of one of the major labels if I would have went that route. I love playing ball. I love the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I just didn't want to go there. I wanted to grow up my kids. I wanted, yeah, yeah. I wanted to coach. Yeah, I just realized that. If you, if you would have started your own label then... Oh, I would have been up there with Tommy Mottola and Donnie. And yeah, you would have had all those guys. Yeah, because I was with I had a label with Def Jam with Russell and Leo Cohen. Now is Russell still around? Yeah, Russell Simmons. He's still around, Russell. Yeah, I like I, Russell. He moved. Uh, where did he move, uh, Mickey? By about yeah. yeah. He where did he move? To, I don't know. Some country, Bali. Oh, he moved to Bali. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's getting away from it all. That's oh for yeah. Sure. Well, when you got half a billion dollars, yeah, you, exactly. You go where you want to go. <laughs> you go where you want to go. So. Freestyle, that's what's happening now. Yes. You So tell us about well, the shows you put on. Reinvented itself. So, reinvented itself. So it comes out in 86, 84, 84, sorry. Right. And it blows up. Lisa, Lisa, they start. Now, in my club at the Devil's Nest, all these kids are meeting each other. They're all like teenagers. The drinking age was 18. They start meeting each other. George Lamont, TKA, Sapphire, The Cover Girls, Seduction, Information Society. Now, these are all groups that are taking the situation just like hip hop was. Mm. And they start blowing up, getting on the radio, pop radio, Hot 100, start getting signed by Tommy Mottola signed people, mm. uh, Arista, Live Davis, everybody's starting to sign all these artists thinking it's the next huge thing. It lasted about six, seven years. I had a, a label called uh, Fever Records and we put out the cover girls and they were huge success right. across the country. And then it died in about 92, 93. Uh, the music just was repetitive and it needed new new life. And it just, you know, it had its run. It had an eight, nine year run. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then I did my 20 year anniversary party in the year 2000 and DJ Scribble was my DJ. And everybody was making fun of me because now I'm like 40 something years old and like, Sal, give up that freestyle. It's over the hill. It's, it's like disco. It's dead. It's finished. So I put together all the people I worked with or managed and 5,000 people show up to Club Exit in Manhattan. I'm even, holy shit. How did they, sh how did they find out about it? Because back then you didn't have internet. Old nothing. school. I printed up 50,000 flyers, five by seven, was in front of every club every week. Like when you were at the line, I went everywhere. Not that you were there then. Yeah. But I mean, I went to every club in the city, little clubs, big clubs. I had... 20 people handing out flyers all over. Posters, no radio, 5,000 people. So now all the young promoters who were making fun of me like I was over the hill and everything right. said, oh shit, they don't mean anything alone anymore. But together as a unit, if we put 10 or 12 of them on one night, it'll bring in a couple thousand people. Wow. That's like you did about the oldies, the oldies guys did. Do what? Like doo -wop, one yeah. of them alone didn't really mean much, but if you put them all together. Yes, and I still do doo -wop shows at the Coney Island. You do? Every year, I do once a year. Now, what shows do you do now? Do You just did a show where? At the County Center in uh, in uh, Westchester, White oh, Plains. How many people you have there? Uh, over 2,000. Wow. And yeah. when, are you going to do another show soon, you think? I do that once a year. I do Westbury Theater in Long Island twice a year. We just sold out the week before that one. And it's in New York, right? So you had 2,500 there, 2,000 there. We do Mohegan. We do Foxwood. Our Radio City, we do every year. Uh, the first show at Radio City sold out in two days. And this about is 10 it's years called ago. Fever, is it? F Freestyle Fever. Well, we change the name sometimes. Uh, have different partners, Brian Rosenberg, Adam Torres. We have different partners that we do different venues. And with. how many acts do you have usually? Always 10 to 13 acts. 10 to 13? Yep, only hits. We only let them do the hits. No new songs, you know. 
it's nostalgic. So they, do they play one song, two songs? Some, if it's they had one hit, they do their one hit. That's if it. They had five or six, that's it. So you, it's a three and a half, four hour concert. <clears throat> the crowd loves it. I host the shows. I MC. <laughs> I dress up like Run DMC and I come out and host the shows. And it's a big party. What I did was I, I figured out how to bring a club party into a venue because now they need to sit. So they like to stand, but they got to sit down for a little bit too because the crowd's like 40, 50, and 60. But it's getting younger now because when I get on stage now, I started saying, let me hear 40 and under. It's getting louder and louder because there's no new music. There's no dance music. So could they get up and dance at the show? No, not some of them. If we have it in the front, in, in the uh, in the front, yeah, in yeah, the front, yeah. or they just stand up and dance in their place, and they drink, they, you know, they party, they smoke at a joint, you know, they, they're just they're living that childhood teenage and they're moment a black that night. No, there's Latino. Oh, excuse me, <clears throat> Latino, Latin and Italian, Latin and Italian, the Italian half, half and half. It's amazing. So you got your uh, my Italian crowd there, my my people, my my Bronx people, right. and you got the Latino. The Boric was there, and they love each other, and they love the music, and they show up. At the same people every show, every thousands. Year. Westbury sells out, Coney Island, Bald Hill. Um, I'm doing two shows in uh, New Jersey at Bergen Pack. I got one coming up, State Theater in January. And if somebody wants to go to that show, what are they, how can uh, they get in touch with you, Sal? Like, on uh, feverrecords.com, www.feverrecords.com. And you announce when you're putting on a show. On yes, that, yeah, right? we put right. it up on the website. They could buy that. Then I do the Lehman. I do the Bronx every year. Lehman, Lehman College. 17 years in a row we sold out. Once a year. In March. So if anybody wants to go to one of these shows, they go to Fever... They just got to type in a Ticketmaster or feverrecords.com oh, okay. or, you know, on my website, Facebook or Instagram, right. you know. Now, Sal, I got to talk to you a little bit about this. I got to just break away for one second. Knowing your dad, I mean, you, you, and you opened one of the first gay clubs in, in the Bronx, yep. right? Is that correct? Yeah. That was on Williams Bridge Road and Pelham Parkway. And uh, it was amazing because we had gone through... Uh, you know, the, the era of the DJ, we brought it indoors. And then right. one by one, all those clubs that you were doing, Shay Joey, yeah. Lemon Tree, they all started going out one by one because the bands, the DJ was taking over. You know, he could play 50 hits in one night. Right. So uh, when the place went out of business, you know, uh, we decided to open up uh, a gay club. And it was very successful until the neighborhood from Mar Morris Park started throwing rocks at the windows and stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, we wind up having problems. We had a few beefs with the neighborhood being ejected to having it there. Me, I love all walks of life, you know. Yeah, me too. I, I, I'm a people's person. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I, in 1982, when I worked the limelight, I used to work gay night. I was one of the bouncers there. And yeah. they, were the, they were the greatest guys in the world. Love man. it. Never trouble. Never fighting. Never trouble. Funny as hell. Funny as Chokesters. hell. Chokesters. Yeah. But don't, <laughs> don't, don't get their shit started. Honey. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's true. They'll, they'll tear your ass up. <laughs> yeah, but I remember that. And, and you, this was in 82. So you're even before that. You're like in 70. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was in the 70s. I've, you know, I do a segment on my show called Old School. You're definitely old school. Without a doubt. OG. <laughs> yeah, I would say you're definitely old school. So a couple of questions I like to ask old school guys. Uh, now, growing up, with you know, growing up, well, uh, you don't have any daughters, right? One. You have one daughter. Are you a little more protective of your daughter than your sons? She's the troublemaker, man. The boys were angels. She's, really? She, oh, God, she's trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I, always, I always said that, that girls, gir boys are much easier. Girls? Oh, no, it's terrible. Much easier. No, so hard, you know, because so many things could go wrong, you know, and, and you, you're so worried about them, and they don't listen. They don't, what are you going to do to them? What are you going to do? Be right? home at two. Kid walks into five. What are we going to do? What are you going to do? Wow. Now the boys, pow, smack in the head. What are we going to do with her? Yeah. Yeah, now, dad, I'm going to bed. Now, being an old school guy, is there any traditions that you still keep up with your family? You still have, you still have sauce, macaroni on Sunday? Absolutely. All the holidays, we just spent Thanksgiving together. Right. You know, we got the grandkids come over all the time. So uh, I'm having a great time with, with my son's uh, kids and my daughter just had a baby too so we're having a great time now do they call you grandpa or nona or what they well call? they call me grandpa but my grand older granddaughter made a new name up as a joke grampy 
I don't know why. So now I'm Grampy. You're Grampy. Yeah, she gave me a nickname. So and it's sticking because now the other one's saying Grampy. So so it's sticking. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, my kids uh, are very into sports and everything. So the boys were great athletes. They went to East Chester High School. Right. They broke all the records. Well, you were a great athlete. You were a really good ball player. Yeah, yeah. I I played every sport. Right, and you just and when your kids grew up, you taught them sports. Absolutely, actually, we started the Entertainers Basketball League in Harlem, and it's still going on today. Oh, over forty years later, I played in the first few games in '79 at Mount Morris Park in the right. Bronx and the Rutgers, and uh, the league's still going on today. Forty years later, I played in the first two or three games, uh, two or three years, and right. we, Disco Fever came in first place. And uh, now Fat Joe and all those guys, they had. I don't know. Did he tell you a story about the game with Fat sure, Joe and, yeah. and, and Jay Z? Yeah. Uh, so they had this big tournament. Now it went from local to the biggest rappers and the biggest basketball players in the world are going to be playing in the tournament. Colby, all these people started coming. So Fat Joe is going to play against Jay-Z's team for the title. And um, Fat Joe's team, I don't know what the problem was, something with the bench. Joe wouldn't leave a certain bench to go to the other bench, and Jay-Z's team wouldn't get out of the car, out of the bus. And the game never went on. So Joe wound up becoming the champ, and I just found out the other day who was sitting in the bus but Shaq and Yao Ming. And nobody knows. Wow. And the guy who runs the league, he gave me his card. He said, Sal, I want you to come down and be a guest. He goes, but I said, tell me the story about that. He said, Yao Mean and Shaq was in the in, in the bus. And nobody got to see it. There was thousands and thousands of people. That and was how there. come they didn't play? Joe wouldn't give up this, this bench. And he wound up becoming the champ. And uh, that was it. He even put it in a song. Really? I love Fat Joe. He's the Oh, best. he's a good guy, man. Nice guy. Yeah, the best. Really, I really liked him a lot. Still, still a normal guy. Still gives back to the community. He must right. have gave away two thousand turkeys the other day. Really, uh, Thanksgiving. Yep, yeah, I was watching him. I, he, I mean, he lives in L.A. now, but he li yeah. but he has a place. Oh, he here lives in Miami, L.A. and New Miami York. and L.A. Yeah, you know what? You're a Bronx guy at heart. I'm a Bronx guy at heart. Yeah. I like to do things for the Bronx. I like to do whatever I can. I like to help Bronx people. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's. Um, we, I just did the uh, uh, Making Strides for Breast Cancer. I do it every year. Yeah. I bring entertainment. We were in the Bronx. We had about 20,000 people there. We raised over $40,000 for breast cancer. Uh, every dollar helps, you know. We yeah. do it one dollar at a time. Absolutely. I don't get donations. Yes. I raise it myself yeah. at doing events, yeah. karaoke nights and comedy. And, and again, it keeps the you got a little people keeping them involved so they have something to do. They feel yeah, good about yeah, themselves. Yeah. So they just need somebody to put it together so they can... Get involved, but uh, freestyle is, is so it reinvented itself, and it's had a twenty year run since they started going into arenas. And, well, uh, I know. I've been blessed, so I I'm a pioneer of two different musics in the Bronx. In the Bronx, within ten blocks of each other. Did you hear that, folks? A pioneer of two different musics. Wow, Sal Abatello. Thank you, Chad. You are a gentleman, and uh, uh, more than uh, you know the the things you started. You do a lot of great things for the community, for the communities, mm -hmm. and and all communities, uh, the black community, the Hispanic community, the white community. Colorless, baby. You've always been colorless. You've always been a trendsetter. Uh, the gay community back in the early uh -huh. 70s. Um, and I think that's why you're loved and why so many people love you, Sal. Yeah. But thanks for coming on the show. I had to get your story out there. And I, they're talking about doing your life story. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we got a deal. And uh, unfortunately, COVID held it up for about a year and a half. Right. But the script is written. Uh, right. They're looking it over. And they're trying to pick out the right producers to put it together to get the story out there of how this white Italian dude brought hip-hop indoors. How did this white Italian dude bring hip-hop indoors? Hey, throw your hands in the air and wave them <laughs> like you just don't care. If it came to party with Chaz, somebody say, oh, yeah. <laughs> Freestyle. <laughs> Sal, it's great to see you, man. All right, Chess. All right, folks, that's the end of the show today. Don't forget, if you want to come and see my one man show, go to chazpalmentary.net. Uh, I'll be doing. Uh, John, we got the dates of the show we could do there? Yeah, I got I the dates. Off? I got them up right now. So, your first show is going to be January 5th, Naples, Florida, at the Artiste Naples Performing Arts Center. Okay. January 7th, Steinmetz Hall, Orlando, Florida. January 21st, Huntington, New York at the Paramount. 
And then February 9th, West Palm Beach, Florida, Kravis Performing Arts Center. All right, so all my fans out down in Florida, I'll be down at the arenas down there. And don't forget the Paramount Hotel. Paramount Hotel. Yeah, <laughs> Paramount and, Theater. And don't forget the Paramount Theater in Huntington. Uh, it's, it's a great show. I've been there. I go there f four times a year. Uh, wonderful show. One of the great venues to see a, yeah. a live performance. My merchandise on chazpalmentary.net. Don't forget the wise and the wise guy. My other uh, podcast with Michael Francis. We got new merchandise coming out with that. You can see the link at the bottom here. God bless you, and I'll see you next Monday. <laughs>